Radio Free Palmer 89.5 KVRF presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert Forto and you're listening to our Day 8 coverage of the 2021 Iditarod here on KVRF 89.7 in the Matsu Valley. RadioFreePalmer.org is our live streaming site and you can find all of our episodes over on DogWorksRadio.com. Be sure to check us out on social media by searching DogWorks Radio. And tonight I am joined by my co-hosts Tony Ryder calling in from Kenai, Alaska and Alex Stein calling in from California. Tony, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Well, thank you for joining us. And Alex, how are you tonight? I am doing well. It's um, We are looking to have a new champion come in overnight uh, in, unless something goes very, very wrong um, and there's a colossal storm that just stops everything. We will have um, a 2021 Iditarod champion uh, early tomorrow morning. And with that, uh, it looks, by all intents and purposes, to be Ale- Alex, a uh, Dallas CV, and uh, he's he's about ready or to uh, leave Squintna in about what an hour and a half. Is that right? Yeah, about an hour and ten minutes as as we're taping this. As we're taping this, and interestingly enough, I, I saw that Danny CV had posted sort of a run strategy down the river. And I just wanted to give that a little bit of a musher perspective with that. He said that he can pretty much take it easy because you it's a wide open expanse down the river and you can see miles and miles either uh, in front of you or behind you by, by seeing a headlamp. And that is absolutely true. I remember on some of our river trips, I was chasing after people on the river and I thought for sure that they were a lot closer to me than they were. But boy, I tell you what, uh, it was several miles separated by that, that bouncing headlight back and forth. So I, I think that, uh, he will use that as a good gauge and he can, uh, go faster or slower based on that. But I think that uh, we're going to have a race down the river, and I think that uh, Mr. Burmeister is going to give him a run for his money, isn't he? Yeah, you know, the the problem is that Aaron is just about a little bit over an hour behind, uh, an hour and one minute behind, and there's only 67 miles between Skwetna and the finish at Deshka. So, um, you know... uh, Dallas did a really good job at holding Aaron off for um, uh, most of today before they before they got into Squetna. So Aaron is really going to have to be much faster, or else he's just going to run out of trail um, before he's able to to catch up. Now it's it's not totally out of the realm of possibility that that could happen, and certainly we've seen teams that have had things go wrong or, or had uh, dogs that just didn't want to go or, or weren't going as fast in the latter start parts of the um, race. But it really does seem like Dallas has almost an insurmountable advantage at this point. Yeah. Tony, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, you know, I think barring any unforeseen circumstances, it's going to be really tough for Aaron to make it up. If this was any normal year, I think it would be a much closer race by the time we were talking about the finish. Um, but with that, you know, 100 miles that they would normally have not being there, there's just not enough time. But Aaron ran such a great race. But there's a part of me that's kind of hoping that Dallas has his, he has his own little worries of falling asleep and going down the wrong river. And I'm almost kind of hoping that we have not, maybe not a mistake so that he doesn't win, but let's have a little excitement. Not that I want a 2014 again, but I I don't know. I I, I was really hoping for a closer finish, maybe with 
ski pole jousting or something. Ski pole jousting. You know, speaking of <laughs> speaking of getting a, not enough sleep and uh, taking the wrong trail down the river, that is definitely a possibility. But I don't know if you guys saw the update. I saw it right before we went went on air about those dang. Uh, ponies that we talked about last <laughs> night. Evidently, uh, they broke through the fence last night, and they were they were really causing some ruckus around Dallas and his team because they kept running over near him. I guess there's a a broken fence, and they didn't have enough people to corral them. And eventually, somebody uh-huh. was able to uh, persuade them away with with some straw. But it's my understanding that they only got about fifteen hour fifteen hour fifteen minutes. Of of sleep because of all of the uh all of the wildlife there i wonder if they did not think about this going in because i assume that uh that uh this was thought about what do you think tony the only thing i wonder is animals are such creatures of habit and i feel like we would have heard about the ponies if they were an issue in years past so the only thing I can figure is the horses don't normally come back into the rainy pass area until maybe after everybody's gone through. And in a normal year, that would mean they go to Nome. They won't come back through rainy pass. And so maybe the horses were just as surprised as the rest of us when they start mingling around and there are people and there are dogs. But, you know, I mean, I'm, I get hangry too and I want my food right now. So I'm pro pony. Pro pony, very good, uh, Alex. Um, we we've been talking a lot this race about Aaron Burmeister. This guy has been running Iditarod for a long time. He's one of those folks that uh, people that aren't uh, really involved in the uh, you know in the Iditarod and in the mushing community may not know much about Aaron and I wanted to make sure that we could let our fans know a little bit about this guy because this guy is uh is a I did a rock contender for a long time what what do you know about Aaron Burmeister yeah so Aaron ran his first race in all the way back in 1994 so he has been running this race for um whatever that is 20 27 years um which is, which is a pretty long time. And for, for his first uh, 10 or 15 years, he was like a solid middle of the packer, started doing better and better. And then starting in 2009, he's had six um, top 10 finishes, including finishing uh, third in 2015, which is his best time. And last year he was fifth. And yet he's one of these mushers who – is not really looked at as being a top contender. That certainly is going to change based on this race. Um, I can tell you also that he's, uh, he's 45. So, um, so he must have been 18 the first time he ran, 18 or 19 the first time he ran Iditarod. Uh, born and raised in Nome, um, went to the University of Alaska at Fairbanks, and is a construction worker, and he has uh, he loves dog sled racing, loves Alaska, um, and lives part time in Nome, I believe, and part time in Ninana. So uh, he he kind of strikes me as you know a throwback to that sort of blue collar musher that we used to see a lot more in the 1970s and 1980s. And, and maybe have not seen all that much in recent years. Yeah, speaking of a throwback, uh, back to an earlier time, when we were heading out last year on our serum run expedition that went from Ninana to Nome, we met up with Aaron in uh, at the start there in Ninana, and we were having questions about how to get to Old Minto, and nobody could figure out the trail that we needed to run on. And Aaron, in typical Alaskan fashion, he broke out a, 
a, an old napkin or a piece of paper, crumpled up piece of paper, and drew out uh, a trail. Uh, you know how they do when you draw directions out on a napkin. And he drew out those directions for us for a 35 mile run with, oh, you know, go up here to the to this trail crossing and you'll see a, a booty hanging on a tree. You'll want to turn left there and you'll want to go about 300 yards past the railroad tracks and, and bear a right at this bent down tree and all of these things he was saying to us uh, that that uh, that he knows like the back of his hand because that is his training route that he runs when he's in Nenana and he grooms all of those trails and of course runs loops around uh, those areas. But I just had to tell that story because it is such a a uh, an Alaskan type story, it's such a mushing type story that. Uh, that you would only know if you've been on both sides of the fence, so to speak, as as a trail guy as well as a musher. So definitely a cool guy. I've known Aaron for a few years. Don't know him very well, but uh, uh, we've we've definitely spoke on occasion or two. Uh, Tony, do you know anything about Aaron Burmeister? Um. Well, you know, he did try to retire a few years back. It wasn't that long ago. Um, he sold off a few dogs, or well, I think quite a bit of his team, actually. Um, Dallas Stevie was one of the mushers that picked up a few of Burmeister's dog as he was getting out of the, the mushing competition business. And um, and then Dallas went on to win the 2012 Iditarod, and I think one or uh, several of the dogs that Burmeister had sold, I think, had made uh, Dallas's team. And then the next thing we know, Aaron Burmeister's back in the race. Yeah. Um, which I wouldn't blame him either. If you know, if you know that you know, it's not just in my heart that these are the best dogs, but they are. Um, I'm sure that lit a fire underneath him, and he's one of those. He's just a solid musher, and it's so exciting to see him uh, come in a second. And it kind of bugs me that a lot of the talking heads that follow the race are surprised that he's in the position that he's in. Um, because it, it's not surprising if you if you really follow the race. It should not be surprising that Aaron's right up there challenging for first. Right. And, Alex, just one more thing about uh, these front runners here with um, Aaron Dallas and Brent Sass there in those top three positions. Uh, what do you think? Is this – I know we talked at the, at the very first that this was going to be a much different race, and I said that – uh, Brent will do very well because of all of his experience on the Yukon quest. But aside from that, do you see any, uh, anything that you didn't see coming, uh, where we stand right now? You know, um, I had in my, I think we only talked about our predicted top three, but the other two in my top five, one of them was, uh, Millie Purcell. And I put her there more, more as an aspirational thing than because I actually thought that she would finish in the top five, but she is in fourth place right now. She's a little bit ahead of Wade Mars and, actually, um, what? Uh, Wade just came in the sweat now right before her. Actually, I just watched it on the live cam. <laughs> oh, okay. So, but she's, she's, uh, she's right she there. is, she's right there with Wade. So they're, they're, they're very, very close. Um, and uh, so it looks like she is probably going to be either fourth or fifth. It doesn't seem like she'll be able to make up uh, enough, um, enough time to get ahead of Brent Sass, but uh, she and Wade will be, you know, battling it out for fourth place. And that, that is very exciting. And I think there are a lot of people who may have discounted her, um, even after she got rookie of the year last year. Um, and, uh, you know, she wasn't entirely sure that she was going to keep running Iditarod, but this is certainly someone who I think if she keeps at it and decides that this is what she wants to do, she will win this race within, within four or five years. 
Uh, speaking of the back of the Packers, we always like to talk about those. And for folks that are listening now, remember that we don't just end our coverage uh, after the front runners come in, which would be tonight would be our last show or tomorrow. We usually go all the way through until the Red Lantern. And right now we're looking at uh, from 32nd to 37th, we have Larry Doherty, Jeremy Traska, Will Troshinsky, Victoria Hardwick, Dakota Schlossler, and Hal, Hal Hansen. I know we're going to talk about Hal in just a second, but do either one of you guys know what happened with Larry Doherty's um, vaccine program that he was going to do? Uh, was there any talk about that on social, on social media and or the insider? Because I haven't seen anything in any of the news reports, uh, you know, on, on, on the TV channels or in the newspaper reporting, have you, either of you seen it? The, the only thing I saw was before the race started, there had been some, some discussion about whether he would, you know, actually have live vaccine and there are issues with, with having, uh, with having the vaccine and in, in terms of the temperature that it has to be stored at and all, all sorts of things like that. And I believe what was decided is that he would have the, um, the containers of vaccine mm -hmm. without the, um, the actual vaccine in them. So it was more of a, um, more of a ceremonial or, or, or sort of uh, metaphorical thing to mm -hmm. be carrying the vaccine than actually mm -hmm. having, you know, uh, uh, vials of vaccine that might, mm -hmm. that might otherwise spoil or, or, or be wasted. So, um, the decision was made to, to keep the vaccine for people who who need and want it and let him let him go up the trail with something that was more of a representation of the vaccine. And before, Tony, I get your thoughts on that. As far as I know right now, Alaska is the only state in the country that is allowing everybody uh, that uh, works and or lives here to get a vaccine. And that's a big deal. Uh, for for us up here and of course I, I hope that uh, everybody uh, makes the right decision whether they're going to do it or not that's personal but uh, it is being offered to everybody that lives or works here uh, Tony do you know anything else about uh, Larry and his crusade compared to what Alex said you know I haven't heard anything I haven't seen anything other than when um, I think it was Alaska's news source they took a picture of him holding one of the containers um, that it was taken, I think, at the beginning of the race. So I think Alex got it all. <laughs> right. And Alex, one other thing before we jump over into our uh, musher profile, there seems to be a story, but I've forgotten exactly the details, about Jeremy Traska and his wife, like they switched spots at the very end. Do either you or Tony know the uh, details of that story? I actually don't know the details of that. That's, that's very interesting. Tony? Um, yeah. Uh, so I do remember seeing um, the announcement when uh, Shaney said that Jeremy would run his rookie race instead. They'd gotten permission for that. Um, the only thing I understand is Shaney's been having some um, medical concerns, personal concerns, and that she was not feeling up to being well enough to care for the dogs in a stressful um, race. I almost want to say that she did a post not too long ago explaining what's going on with her, but I can't for the life of me remember if I'm just dreaming that or not. Um, but it, it really had to do with just her own health concerns. Um, and he's doing really well. I'm, I'm not shocked that he's doing really well, but, uh, and you know, it's, it's nice to see that Iditarod was able to accommodate that in, in a year that's been really topsy turvy. And that, that, uh, brings up memories of last year with that really late switch with Jeff King and Sean Underwood. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was also a medical issue, uh, with Jeff that, uh, that they had to act on pretty quickly. I don't think it was nearly that quick uh, with these guys. No. I, I think it was uh, like a month out or something like that where they, mm -hmm. where they made that. So if we can find some more details, maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow. But otherwise, Alex, uh, who do we have tonight? We talked about Hal. What do we know about him and uh, what is his profile? 
So Hal Hansen is a very interesting musher. He is one of the few mushers that I'm aware of who is a former cowboy, uh, although I, I, I imagine that there are others. I'm just not all that aware of them. Uh, I think Quince Mountain has had a, a background with, with horses as well. So um, he was born and raised in Stillwater, Oklahoma, grew up on a ranch, um, and very early on became interested in working with animals, uh, became a cow trainer for his father, was working as a cowboy, <laughs> excuse me, uh, decided that he really wanted to have some kind of career working with horses. So um, he became a full-time cowboy in 1999 and um, grew his business so that it eventually was serving five states around Oklahoma. And in 2013, he decided that he didn't want to be in the heat anymore and he wanted something cooler. So he headed north, um, spent his first three years in Alaska training sprint dogs on the Yukon River and uh, learning all about mushing. And then one day he uh, was looking to move into more long distance mushing and looking to eventually uh, run the Iditarod. And he saw an ad for Mitch Seavey's kennel in uh, 2017 and came down to Kenai to uh, work with Mitch, initially training um, uh, younger animals and training training uh, some of Mitch's yearlings. And uh, Mitch said before the start that the thing about Hal is that he's kind of a um, an animal whisperer that he can just like speak to animals and they listen, they understand, and they respect him. And and this is something that he demonstrated first with horses and now with dogs. He's running. Um, He's running Mitch's puppy team uh, this year, and the team is 14 dogs, and 12 of the 14 are yearlings, and there are a couple of others who are just a little bit older but have never been on a uh, anything more than a mid-distance race. Um, so his goals in running this race are very different than the goals of, you know, like um, a Brent Sass or, or a Ryan Reddington. Um, he is there to train the dogs, and most of these dogs are dogs that he has known all of their lives, that he's been working with for the past two years. So they're dogs that he is very, very familiar with. So the goal is to get these dogs used to the rhythms and the, um, and the different kind of circumstances that you would have in a long-distance race as opposed to either a mid-distance race or training runs where you – where you go out for a few hours and then you come back. So that's an entirely different kind of mindset. And so for him to succeed in this, it does not require that he finish anywhere near the front of the race. And in fact, he has pretty consistently been <laughs> in the back of the pack or in the red lantern position, which is totally fine because the goal is, to give these dogs a great experience when they're running this race. And so that some of them will become like the, uh, the great Mitch CD dogs of, you know, 2024 or 2025, but just to get them uh, to have a lot of fun and to do that. He, when he came into McGrath on the way out, he said that he told the insider that, he had run into a lot of overflow and he had 60 pounds of ice attached to his sled. And he had to spend several hours chopping the ice off of his sled with his ax. And sometimes uh, I did our odd mushers complain about required equipment and say, you know, I've never used my ax. And, and here he is chopping 60 pounds of ice off of his sled. He also said that, um, because he spent so much time on the Yukon River doing uh, training sprint dogs, that when he got over the Alaska range, it felt to him like he was coming home. And he uh, said that he stopped on the top of Rainy Pass, and it was a very emotional moment for him. And he went up and down the line, and he talked to each of the dogs, and he said, 
I promised you when you were a puppy that I would get you here. And here we are. Um, he said he has very big, powerful dogs, which are great for going uphill, but he has to really keep riding the brake when they're going down because he described them as being, when they run free, they're a little bit like teenage boys on cocaine. Um, he told uh, Alaska's news source that his run so far has been like a fairy tale, that there haven't been any, uh, any real severe obstacles that he's had to overcome, that he's just taken it one section at a time following uh, the, the race plan that Mitch laid out before, um, before he started. He is currently in 33rd place, uh, nearly to Nikolai, and the dogs that he's running are, um, 12, as I said, 12 of the 14 uh, are yearlings, and the dogs he's running are Grunge, Hip Hop, Fez, Derby, Pacino, De Niro, Bowler, Jarvis, Sanford, Longo, Sparrow, Reggae, Clue, and Blues. And he has 13 of those 14 dogs still in harness um, and uh, dropped Reggae a little while ago, but he's keeping them there. And, and for someone running a puppy team, it's really important that you give the dogs a great experience and that you finish with as many of these dogs in harness as possible. And, and I know because I, I, I pre-planned this a little bit that um, Tony has a great story about how um, <laughs> and Mitch's kennel. So I just want to turn it over to Tony for that. Sure. Um, I'll just say first off that everything Alex said about uh, Hal just being an upbeat and great guy is very, very true and very much true that he is an animal whisperer. Um, when I go out to take uh, pictures of the dogs for Mitch for his profiles or whatever he needs, um, Hal's the one that gets to help ra uh, wrangle the dogs and get them to feeling comfortable because most high strung dogs do not like big cameras in their faces, especially ones that seem to take after their much musher like Mitch, who also seems to be afraid of cameras. Um, but I digress. So one of the reasons why Hal wanted to pack up and move to Alaska was um, he told a story to Alaska News Source that um, he was watching a news story about Mitch CV when he won in 2013, and he saw one of Mitch's lead dogs in Nome, and here is all this hoopla. They're trying to get this dog to look at the camera so that they can get a picture of the musher with his two best dogs or his two best lead dogs. And um, this dog was just looking back behind him like he was looking down the trail wanting to keep going and just explore more. And, um, and Hal said, I kind of felt an attachment to that dog. I thought, you know, I want to feel like that dog. And that dog was uh, Mitch Stevie's star lead dog, Tanner. Uh, Tanner was one of those lead dogs that uh, when the going got tough, he just found a way to get through the the overflow and, and all of that. So he became a very, very special dog in the CV kennel. Um, and uh, so now it's been a little while. Tanner has actually passed on. He had an operable cancer and he passed away in Hal's arms actually um, because he just decided that Tanner was going to be his dog, <laughs> one of the retirees. And, um, and so he's actually carrying, and this, actually choked me up the other night when I read the story, but um, he's actually carrying Tanner's, um, not his collar, but his tag with him as he crosses over the Iditarod Trail. Um, Tanner was such a great dog. Um, he was very much, he knew that he was the best. Uh, he had kind of that attitude and he definitely gave it to me in pictures uh, the first year he didn't want pictures the second year he just stood there like yeah I know who I am um, so I, I totally connected with that part of Hal's story um, just a just a really nice 
guy, you, you just pull for the nice guys in the race and, and Hal's definitely one of those. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool story, Tony. Thanks for sharing that. It, it's those little stories that we like to share that, uh, that you don't hear on most other uh, uh, podcasts or other coverages that we do. And, and I really appreciate that on a lighter note. I do think that, uh, if those ponies are still running around, he will be the one to corral <laughs> them, uh, when he passes back <laughs> through. So, so, uh, maybe they can, uh, maybe they can employ him for an hour or two to get, to get those dang ponies back where they need to go for sure. So guys, uh, uh, a little lighten the load a little bit from the, 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 uh, the sad story of about Tanner there, but we really appreciate that. So guys, when we're on tomorrow night, uh, it looks like we will have definitely have a champion by then. And for, uh, pretty much 24 hours a day from that point on, uh, folks will continue to pass through the finish line. Alex, can you set us up just a little bit about that whole process? I know it's going to be much, much different this year. There's no no festivities or anything, but what can people expect, uh, you know, from a fan's perspective with this kind of this 24 hour a day rotation of folks just coming in? Who's there? What do they do? Uh, et cetera. Can you sum that up in just a couple of minutes? Yeah. So as you said, it's going to be very different. Normally people would cross under the burled arch and then the dogs would go to the dog lot in Nome and, People would, uh, the mushers would be staying with host families and would would hang out there for a few days until the banquet. And um, they're usually in Nome is probably a few thousand people on Front Street when the winter comes in. And then less and less as as, uh, other mushers come in and the popular mushers always draw a crowd and they, they, uh, sound the uh the big um uh fire klaxon alarm thing to indicate that a a musher is coming in and that's that's all really cool and it's really exciting and it's just uh you know it's a bit of a party atmosphere in Nome um once people start coming in uh this year it's going to be very different because uh they just announced as as you reported last night that they're going to let cars into Deshka Landing, so people will be able to observe the uh, the people, the teams coming in. Um, I imagine that that space is very limited, so we might see for the winter coming in, we might see a few hundred people, but I don't think it will be much more than that right at the finish. Uh, and then, you know, from there. Since there's no dog lot to go to, I believe most of them will be met by their their handlers and their teams, and they'll they'll pack the dogs up and they'll uh, you know start heading home or, or head back into Anchorage until they can get a float flight home. Um, it's it's a strange thing because there's no there's not going to be a finishers banquet this year either. Um, so I imagine it's going to feel very strange for people who have been, you know, out, out in this intense 24 hour a day environment to suddenly be, be, you know, home and they don't have to necessarily go anywhere or, or, you know, they don't have to, they don't have to feed their dogs and they don't have to, you know, they don't have to feed their dogs every, every, uh, whatever, three hours or, or they don't have to, you know, survive on no sleep. So um, it is definitely going to be different. My hope is that people do not forget that there are, you know, many, many mushers on the trail. It's not just, it's not just the top three or four. There's 37 people who are still running this race. And I hope that when it gets to, you know, number 20 or number 30 or, or, or 35 that people will still come out because it is such an achievement to be able to finish an Iditarod, even an Iditarod that is a little bit shorter this year than normal. And even an Iditarod that doesn't go to Nome. So everyone 
it, you know, everyone who enters this race, everyone who qualifies and enters this race is deserving of enormous respect. And everyone who finishes this race should be celebrated in my book. And you know, Every- Alex, uh, uh, this is so interesting that in the 49 years of running the race, I don't think that we have ever had a champion. And this is if Dallas wins, I don't think we've ever had a champion that can literally sleep in their own bed the same night that they win their race. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. he, he's only, he's only about 20 miles or so North of, uh, of Deshka landing where his, where his house is 20 or 30, I guess it is. And, uh, if he gets in at a, a respectable hour, he could literally go home and go to bed, uh, tonight or, you know, early in the morning and, uh, and, get his rest in his own bed. That's, that's, that's really interesting to me. Uh, like you said, most of them will just pack up and go home, but, uh, it's going to be a very interesting atmosphere as, as we see it. And and I'm interested to following along with that. Tony, do you have anything else to, to, uh, mention before we go? Yeah, I kind of feel like I'm the Debbie Downer tonight. Um, I just noticed from the, I did a Rod's Facebook page and I guess they're the official, people for the race so we should probably listen and Alex did such a great job of talking about people fans coming down to the finish but the Iditarod said please note the race finish is only open to staff volunteers family and handlers (laughs) 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 and and it says if you are camping along the trail please stay clear of the finishing Right. Oh, Alrighty one, then. one one other th- one other thing, Alex. Uh, I I think that everybody is is back. Everybody is back through McGrath, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Uh, no yeah. other pro- No other problems with COVID, right? N- not that we've heard. They're supposedly they were retesting everybody at McGrath, and if there had been any further positives, I'm sure we would have heard about it very quickly. That's good news, and uh, hopefully, yeah. uh, I know they're going to retest again. I think you said it's Squintna the other day. Hopefully, nobody uh, comes up positive there when they only have that 60-odd miles to go. So, guys, okay. tomorrow night, uh, and- we will be back on, uh, and we will have uh, uh, the announcement of the of the, of the the winner and, and probably 15 other teams by then to talk about, but we will be on, and be sure to hit that subscribe button so you get the notice right when this show drops. So on behalf of my co-hosts, Alex Stein and Tony Ryder, this is Robert Forto for Mushing Radio. We will see you guys next time. Goodbye. From Dog Works Radio, this is Mushing Radio. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you'll see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe, too. Your hosts are Alex Stein and Robert Forto. Our producer is Robert Forto, created for Dog Works Radio.